All right, so I'll officially call the meeting to order. Um, I'm not an elected chair of this committee, but I'm the most bossy person, so I tend to be the one who does it. If anybody else would like to uh, run or facilitate the meeting, I'm willing to hand that over. Um, what we've done for the last two meetings is we've just kind of discussed our um, you know, different ways of thinking about what uh, the resource replacement fee could be in terms of cost per acre, uh, originally cost per acre uh, for <coughs> putting land into APR. Um, and so we have some history there. Um, and there were some other things people suggested in emails. I have since then had a meeting with, um, with Beth uh, who does, you know, basically solar. Uh, could you, could you remind us of pilot you? deals? Um, and so I have my notes from that meeting. Um, but uh, other people have had other things I saw in the email. I haven't read every single thing though. So I wonder if, um, uh, if we have anything new that's new since like the first or second meeting, maybe we can go around and that'll help Hannah catch up with kind of what we've been thinking about. And I think since Judy brought stuff to the very first meeting, maybe Judy can start and we can go around the room and with whatever thoughts people had to, to add. Okay, well, I drafted some minutes that I hope would bring Hannah up to speed um, of both, both the first two meetings. They were very helpful, I saw them, thank you. And they had the attachments on the data I had presented at each, yeah. so. Oh, I suppose we should accept those minutes. I, the only thing I would want to change is I'd want to get my, put my name as Joyce Palmer Fortune, because that's okay. my name. Um, but that's it. That's all I would uh, add to those fine minutes. There. Everybody's afraid that if they comment, they'll have to do them next time. Mm. Um, okay, so you don't want to go around and kind of recap what we've been well, doing. Well, I everything I had this I would have said for what I had brought was was in those minutes, except that I think I sent um, chapter sixty one land values at another time, and yeah. I can make sure that that uh, Hannah gets those if she doesn't have them already. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm looking back on everything Judy has sent me since uh, September. And uh, yeah, if I go back oh, to I September did. George 28th. Asked for the, I'm sorry, I talked over you. George asked for the planning board's purpose in creating yeah. the, and the best statement I could find I sent, I don't have it in front of me, but I don't think it would solve yeah. the question that George wanted solved, so. But basically said we were trying to protect more land to make up for that which was taken. Okay. Um, Stop laughing, John. No, no, I'm carrying on two different conversations at once. Mm. Okay, so Judy doesn't want to talk about what happened in the past. John, tell me where okay. you stand. First, first things first, I'm John Devine and I serve as the secretary to the Agricultural Commission in Whateley. And uh, regrettably, I missed the October 14th meeting. And I did clip some minutes from our AgCom meeting that was held on October 12th. And I can review the points that they, they came up with at our October 12th meeting. And the members agreed that a flat rate equal to $10 a panel should be assessed to all solar projects where agricultural land is impacted. Agricultural land being both farmland and forest land because you know that the forest land has a harvest value. So it's all in, in at least the eyes of the Waitley Ag Commission Ag includes both open and forested land. Okay, so that's the first point. The second point was 
that the members were not in favor of any credit or fee reduction for dual use projects. Dual use being that you have a solar array and you're farming under it. You know, whether that's grazing or cropping or whatever, the, the, the committee was not in favor of any kind of credit or fee reduction for that dual use. And the reason why is because that's still theoretical. There has not been a lot of facts or, um, or numbers put together for the dual use solar ag. Um, and then the, the third comment from the members was they questioned the applicability of the resource re replacement fees. Specifically, how could the fees be assessed to a large scale ground mounted solar project without assessing similar fees to other commercial development projects where ag resources were being converted. So those are the three points that we made or that were made at the AgCom meeting on October 12th. Okay. Could you describe how you got the $10 a panel fee? You know, uh, our chairman is Doug Coldwell and they have ag panels on two different farms and he's the one that said you know that 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 would be fair that that is a pretty at least in his mind and any other member's mind that would be a fair assessment and i think my notes say that there's something like um 80 panels per acre so that would be 800 dollars per acre Okay, that would be a but specific there, there size again, panel would, then. Say I that think again. that uh, when you say per panel, that's I think a little vague because okay. um, panels come in different sizes. Okay, that, um, I, so I, we, I will get back to them for it, for this the, the size right. panel that they're talking about. But if it's if you know that it's already eighty panels per acre, then mm -hmm. you could make it a per acre. Uh, thing it sounds like um, it, okay. you're saying that they think eight hundred dollars per acre yes. is fair due to somebody who has panels on their site Correct. already. And and there okay. was a discussion of what the goal was of these fees. Yeah, and that that and what did they think the goal was? Reviewed in the minutes. Excuse me. What uh, what did they think the goal was? Well, they they wanted to know what the the goal of the, of the resource replacement fees. Oh, oh, they didn't know what the goal was. Oh, okay. No, right. Yeah. And okay. that's been discussed in the minutes. Okay. Um, George. Okay, I had the same questions about uh, how you arrived at the per panel um, cost and uh, the same reservations that Joyce has in that we don't know, know what the technology is gonna do. They may, they may come out with panels that are uh, eight by 12 rather than two by four, or whatever they are. And Agreed. We, we can't predict that technology. So to get tied in to that, I, I think it's much better to translate to a per acre charge. A per um, acre. Yeah, in fact, the bylaw I think calls for a two per acre charge. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I, I think on mm -hmm. the third point, it's in those uh, that John mentioned from the Ag Commission. Um, the only reason we've got the resource replacement fee is because we can do it for solar. We can't necessarily do that for land that goes out of production to build houses. Okay. But Thank we're you. just, I don't think we're allowed to do that. Okay. Um, so, Joyce, what, en what enables us to do that for solar? We passed a bylaw, and the attorney general signed off on it. Okay. But it's strictly I, I don't bylaw. know that it is conceptually impossible to do it for residential, mm. but oh, but um, yeah. residential is would be difficult because residential uses are by right, mm -hmm. and they don't get reviewed by right by mm -hmm. um, any committee. Right. I think it would have to be. I, I don't know what the mechanism right. would be or how it would work. Right. And, and I think because there is a, and I also think it would probably not be especially popular. Yeah. 
And um, it reminds me, though, I, I only breezed through it a little bit, but Hannah sent something about Littleton doing something similar for, it wasn't for solar, but maybe it falls closer to the category you're talking about, where um, uh, I think there was a, a, a trade-off between conserving more farmland and being able to pack houses in closer together somewhere else, and there was a fee involved. And I didn't read it all in detail, but it sounds like that might be something to consider at a later date if we thought that was. Actually, um, actually, I think there's a lot there that's very relevant for what we're doing, too. So, but mm -hmm. yeah, but I th the short answer to John's question is because we don't have a bylaw in place that allows that at this point. OK, thank you. OK, yeah. I've been okay. reaching out to land trusts uh, without any luck. Um, there was mm. one little little bit of data that came from Hilltown, um, which uh, Joyce threw into a spreadsheet and I forwarded yesterday. I've tried a couple other contacts at um, Kestrel. Um, nothing back from there. I've tried again at Mount Grace. And uh, I know that Judy has tried again with um, Franklin. And uh, Franklin will be able hopefully to get data to us by the end of next week. And what they are going to do is to get the actual purchase data. The woman there who's in charge of their database raised a very interesting question, I thought. She said, well, to find the actual purchase data or the value of the restriction is, is quite easy. What would be hard to get or would take, she said it would take some teasing out, uh, would be data on administrative costs or staff costs in putting these on and also appraisal costs. Um, I know that when Waitley Woods was done, the estimate of the total cost included staff time and the CPC was a bit taken aback because we had always thought that that was something that the land trust was contributing to the process. And they wanted the donors to contribute that. So that's, that's a complication. Um, so if we do start to pursue the, the land trust data, in more depth, we may want to address that and think about it. I asked if she would try to give a, a guesstimate of what it might be. Um, so we'll see what we get. I think she's quite precise. I don't know whether she would do that or not. It's sort of something sometimes people are willing to do and sometimes they're not. I do know that when the CPC looks at these transactions, we can pay for appraisal costs out of something called our administrative expense budget, which, um, so it doesn't have to come out of the open space fund directly. So it might be that that's not a necessary expense. The administrative expense budget's about $9,000 a year. So it, it covers ongoing expenses, but that's precisely the kind of thing that it's there for, to expenses to support development of these projects. Okay. All right. Is it time for me to report on the homework I had? Yeah. Okay. Um, Brian and I had a, about a one hour conversation with um, Beth Greenblatt, who has helped us in the past with um, solar pilot agreements. Um, and the expertise that Beth brings to the table is that she understands the solar incentives on the state level. She understands uh, how the money flows within uh, a solar project. And uh, she actually believes that these things should be taxed appropriately. Um, not overtaxed, not undertaxed, but just taxed appropriately 
on the on the local level and that's one of the that's what one of the big things she does with her uh, small consulting unit is uh, she she helps towns come to various agreements and she was uh, very intrigued by the um, the question because it's not what she d- deals with every single day but she started out wanting to understand better um, what's our purpose and that if our purpose is to help keep land in agricultural use then she actually in disagreement with um, with the Ag Commission um, so so don't get mad John uh, uh, no. that um, you, you know if agricultural land and keeping um, facilities in, in you know agricultural use I mean what the state does with this uh, so-called smart program uh, is they incentivize, certain things and don't incentivize others um, for they have a very strict definition of dual use uh, and they have a big incentive for dual use that mm-hmm. someone who's willing to do a project under dual use gets six cents per kilowatt hour wow. and if they decide not to do dual use and just take the farmland and plaster it with with cells they can't make up that six cents per kilowatt hour. So they would be leaving, if they decide not to do dual use, they're leaving money on the table, which is unlike, you know, business people don't like doing that. Um, (laughs) So it's um, the dual use, they do have, it's very well-defined and uh, somewhat restricted. And there was a couple restrictions that um, I wrote down here and there are probably some more that I, that I you know, won't uh, be able to, to remember or, uh, or list. Um, the ones I remember best is that the land is only covered at any time, uh, 50% of the sunlight can be blocked at any time, which means if Correct. it's dual use, then you'll use trackers because that's the only way to keep more or less a constant amount of, um, of or, or, or not increasing and decreasing as the day goes by amount of okay. land um, from, from sun. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing, let's see, uh, farm or livestock. Very sp- um, so, oh, let me get the other. Let me look on the next page. Um, they have a, uh, a smaller number of square feet of solar per acre. Um, the, she said, "What well, we should, and I have not had time to do it, we should get in touch with the people in Northfield because they are right now going through the process on a dual use, large scale uh, 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 solar project on agricultural land. It's a two megawatt project, which for us would be, I think, 10 acres ish. Uh, but there it's, it's clearly got to be on a bigger bit of land. Um, and they get this uh, six cents per kilowatt hour on top of all these other incentives. Um, oh yeah, here it is. Not more than 50% uh, coverage. Um, it's, they find the incentives are easier to tie to like either production or capacity. Um, mm-hmm. So we might consider having it instead of a cost per acre, um, have an equivalent cost per uh, megawatt or kilowatt in capacity. Um, but I think, uh, you know, if you assume something about the density of the panels, you can convert uh, panels to acres or megawatts to acres and so on. So I'm, I'm not that worried about that, although because of um, this dual use option, that's actually something that's kind of, um, uh, it, it, it adds a factor of two or divide by two um, if you were to have those panels more spread out. So the cost per acre might not be as fair if you're doing it dual use. Um, and there's something about here about they can make an additional two cents per kilowatt hour, but my notes are not that good. Um, so they're, I think they're at the, the point uh, somewhere between their preliminary and final statement of qualification at that project in Northfield. Uh, so that's, um, that was one thing. She actually said what we should consider is if someone's willing to come in and they're going to use farmland for solar, that we should consider 
further incentivizing that, that the smart program has a uh, six cents per kilowatt hour um, incentive that we should consider waiving the fee, the local fee, if they're willing to do dual use. And I, I mean, I understand what John just told us that the Ag Commission is against that, but I'm just reporting what we talked about in the conversation. Um, <laughs> and that's basically to, to really keep the land in farm production, in agricultural production, and it lets gives the farmer the flexibility to be able to earn uh, money or generate their own energy or any of the other reasons why someone might want to put solar on their property. So that's um, that. Joyce, so that, that's a conflict we would have to. I mean, Joyce, so we're getting you, ideas of, of two different kinds here. So I'm just want to acknowledge that. Before you leave that, um, I have no sense of six cents per kilowatt on how much would they make otherwise. I mean, if it's six cents on, well, Chris Kellogg said the other day that the, the project that was proposed for Chestnut Plain Road, the woman who was there for Eversource said they were gonna make 49 cents a kilowatt on that. Um, and a lot of that is the incentives, though. And yeah, um, well, yes, maybe between the battery but storage and but, and, but the, me, uh, and the and the. But if you're getting forty nine cents a kilowatt on eighty percent of the land, as opposed to an extra six cents to have to be reduced to fifty percent, it doesn't sound to me like it's all that profitable. Um. I, I can't back up the, this number that somebody else gave you. I 49 cents per kilowatt hour. Nobody pays that much on my bill. I pay and I pick the higher price tier. I'm paying 13 cents. I know he, that's what he said, but that's what they make with, because yeah. of the incentives. But the so, incentives my guess is a lot of those are the battery incentives then. Well, I can the find that. He yeah. sent me the minutes. It wasn't in the minutes, but I right. can track okay. down the tape if you want. But I thought, anyway, I was curious about the other economics of the project that maybe right. you got from Beth. Um, uh, as, as far as you know, numbers, I think I don't have any other particular numbers from Beth other than for the other thing we asked So if, about, if it wasn't but, dual use, do you have any insight on profitability or how much they could pay? No, I don't have, I, I don't know. And it depends on each project. It's going to depend on if it has batteries or not. Um, it's going to depend on a lot of things. And Beth knows what all of those details are. So that's, and, but she is a consultant. She does this for a living. Um, and if we wanted to get more advice from her, we would probably have to agree to pay her something to right. get more advice on that. Okay. The last thing we talked about was the forested lands. Um, and uh, Beth was going to send me something, but I don't remember getting it. Um, but um, that uh, there, let's see, a restriction on forested lands. Um, they, um, they talked about the quality of the land in terms of habitat, whether it's core habitat, whether it's priority, uh, cr critical natural lands. And if it's in those places, then you can't get any incentives through the SMART program. So that was something that was good to know. And she, the thing she was gonna send was a, uh, a map because they really mapped out all of Massachusetts. It might be that most of our forested land is critical habitat for something or another. You have uh, that map. You have that map in the first batch I sent you yeah. where the critical habitat is in Wheatley. Okay. Um, so uh, she said one way to do it is to tie the fee to meeting the uh, requirements that are in the SMART program already because those are really well-defined and defensible. Um, and that was kind of the, the, w w the way we ended it. Um, was in, you know, in the big picture, we could use what the state has already done with the SMART program 
um, give us a baseline that gives us a very justifiable fee. Okay, because whatever fee we have, we, we do have to justify it at some point. Um, so that's uh, that was kind of the, 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 the final message there. So um, no, I think if, sure we, oh, if we come up with, if we said a million dollars an acre to put up solar, I think someone could take us to court and we would not win. Okay, right. So we yeah, have to have you said yeah, well, that was the, that's, yeah. We, right. And it has and, to be, it can't, it has to be something that can be borne by the project. Right. But and I'm not sure that, how that ties to the SMART program, which is. Because the SMART program ha already has in it a lot of assessment of the values of agricultural and forested land. Well, as a practical <laughs> matter, we don't see any projects that aren't SMART in program incentives, so. Um, I, I, your, your voice just came out all garbled. I couldn't understand what you said. All the, every project that we have seen in Waitley has been a smart program project. Yeah, and it should be, I think, because otherwise you're leaving money on the table and they don't do that. So given but, that they're applying under the smart program, I'm not quite sure practically what your statement says. Or how how you what that means we should be doing I guess because built into that are um, things that might help us put value on uh, lands that would if you know if you're going to do this on this forested land it might help you value what it is we've lost and then to replace that resource what would be a fair fee. Uh, because the state has put some values on those already, and it's it's not as uh, I, it's not simple enough for me to be able to explain because it's well not what I do for a living, um, but that's something where we can get help from this person if we were to choose to go that route. We may decide that's too complicated, and let's just keep going with um, with the cost of APRs, and that's fine. But my homework was to find out from this person who understands the solar incentives and the financing of solar projects really well, what she thought and what she thought was, if you really want to incentivize people to not permanently take farmland out of production is to let it be dual use. And um, because that's where, the, that's where the state went. So. Yep. Uh, and I will bring that information back to the committee. I'm, I'm looking at it right now online, and it's the SMART Program Incentives for Solar Arrays on Farms. And it's the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources that, that has this program. So I'm going to bring that information and the incentive information back to the committee and see if they, they come around on it. Yeah. John, you might also see if anybody knows anything about how much of this has been done, because... It's my. There's a project in Northfield. Our neighbors are doing this. Well, you mentioned okay. that one, and I know that there's a project in mm. uh, Wareham or somewhere where they're using cranberries. Mm -hmm. But mm. I also know that at UMass they've been trying to push this for five years, and yeah. the state program has been there. The state incentives have been there for at least three years, and there are very very few of these. And well, it's a new thing, uh, right? Well, that's not that new, actually. I mean, well, the, I, the state has had that incentive there for quite a while and it hasn't been taken up. And I think one problem is that except for pasture land, there's not. Or maybe cranberries, they, they're, people are having a hard time trying to find any crops that work. Um, is my sense, but mm. so um, maybe. Maybe the Ag Commission knows more than I do. I would hope they do, actually. Yeah. I certainly yeah. hope they know more than me. <laughs> uh, I'm reading about Category 1 agricultural land, and it says, one, if they're building ground-mounted solar systems, two, are sized to meet no more than 200% of the on-farm demand, or three, 
a dual use system up to two megawatt in capacity, they would qualify for a waiver. So let me let me get this information put together for the committee at their next meeting. And I don't have my calendar right in front of me, but I know our next uh, committee meeting should be held on Tuesday the 9th. If I'm looking at my, my schedule correctly. So I will bring this information to their attention that maybe this dual use has, um, there's some incentives to go that route. Yeah, I'm looking at information now on one in uh, Munson, Mass, that uh, went into production about a year ago. It says it's the first dual use agricultural PV system in Massachusetts. And it's small, relatively, 250 uh, kilowatts. Well, I think that the materials that Hannah sent around on the transfer of development rights for Littleton have some practical applications for us. The, and maybe she could talk to it, but a little background. Transfer development rights is a planning concept that's used to encourage growth in one area and preserve it in another. And so the purpose isn't quite the same as ours. I mean, we're, we're not trying to say you shouldn't build on farmland or forest land. We're trying to say, if you do, we'd like you to help help us protect protect some others. But what they do do in Littleton anyway is come up with a methodology for valuing what this transfer fee should be that I thought was helpful. So yeah, um, I can show you uh, the PowerPoint kind of talk us through it if you'd like. Mm, that would be helpful to me. Awesome. So uh, with TDRs, the transfer of development rights, um, the two areas of land are organized into sending and receiving areas. I think um, uh, what's most applicable to us is the sending area, which is the area that they were trying to conserve in the town of Littleton. Um, Maybe so this is... Sorry? I, f I found this sending area title very confusing. It might help what they're doing is sending their development rights to the other area. Right, exactly. So, so this is like the conservation area. Sending isn't super helpful for us, but yeah, this is the area that we're trying to conserve. So their goal was to try to keep the valuation of this land as simple as possible. So they used the method um, already pre-existing uh, that was created by the Littleton tax assessor. Um, and really all it did was compare, so, I mean, you can read the slide, but um, it just compared the difference of full value of pre-development lands to the assessor's valuation placed on lands under the chapter 61 program. Um, so like it says here, the difference is approximately 10,000 per acre. Um, and then here are some example calculations of the sending area. Um, <clears throat> so, I think here, this is the APR purchases by the state of Massachusetts. This is what you guys had mentioned, I think in previous minutes with the approximate $15,000 value. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you can see this very well, but um, yeah. So anyway, I think that they were aiming for simplicity more than anything else. Um, and they were already going with the assessors. I'm not sure if our assessors already have um, a system like the town of Littleton did um, for the chapter 61 program. Um, but that could be another option for evaluation methodology for the land that we're trying to uh, set aside. Yeah, I think they do. If Maybe it's not as, um, let's put it this way. If you take your land out of chapter, I know that the assessors have a a way of 
evaluating the amount of property taxes you would have owed if, if it hadn't been in chapter and paying that back. So I assume that that's the, the sort of um, market value that they're talking about. And so what they do is basically just take the estimated uh, land value without chapter and, and um, subtract the chapter value and say, this is the, the value of development rights. And, and in fact, that's what it is actually. So it's yeah. a very simple methodology. Yeah. The complication is that there's not one single chapter value for farmland and one for timberland, but I suspect that if Cynthia were asked to do it, she could come up with a weighted average. Mm -hmm. So that was um, another option. I'm not sure if there are other folks that we should bring it to. Um, probably Cynthia, like you mentioned, Judy. Um, well, you and I could go talk to Cynthia and see if, if she could do a simple calculation for us and bring it to the next meeting. Sure, that sounds great. George looks puzzled. <laughs> George looks think, frozen. I think this is sort of the approach that Brian was fishing for, although I don't want to put mm. words in his mouth because he kept that he wanted us to to start this approach to, from the very beginning. So, mm. yeah, to, in in being really clear about what the goal is, and then having a really clear way of making the value, I think that's. To me, that was the value when I first saw the Littleton. Um, yeah, it's a. Stuff it's was a, that ah, oh, there's like a clear way to do this. It's a very lot. It's a nice logic, and it's simple. Yeah, and uh, I'd be interested to see how that number compares to the roughly fifteen thousand per acre that we came up with in terms of you know being able to put new land into uh, conservation with a conservation restriction. So, all right. So at this point, does everybody have some homework? Hmm. I don't think I have any homework technically, but um, <laughs> and it sounds like Judy and Hannah are going to talk to Cynthia. John was going to, uh, I don't know if it's in time, it depends on when our next meeting is, John is going to go back to the Ag Commission with a little more discussion. George was going to keep, purpose. yeah, um, and uh, George was going to uh, keep um, bothering the land trusts. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to hear more from Franklin Land Trust. And I'll also look for the tape on the See if I can track down that 49 cents a kilowatt figure from, from that yeah. solar project. Yeah, that's actually something I think if I sent Beth a quick email and, um, and asked her to give me some context for 49 cents a kilowatt hour. Or just uh, six, six in, cents relative to what, you know, is, if that's one piece of an incentive package. Yeah. Is, is there such a thing as an average incentive package or or an average profit figure? Yeah. Okay, then I guess I have a little bit of homework. Should we do two weeks again? Um, sure, let's look two weeks ahead from today. One, two. Um, that would be uh, Thursday the 11th, which is um, Veterans Day. Uh, are we allowed to have public meetings on Veterans Day? You know, that's an awesome question. I don't know if we're allowed to have public meetings on holidays. Um, the Historical yeah, right. Commission and has said on Mondays, when, when you're not meeting in the public 
building, you can do it, I think. But mm. the Historical Commission has had them on Monday holidays, if that's any help. Oh, and they wouldn't break the law. No. No. I mean, uh, they, they asked and it was permission was granted, but it was I a think. Zoom meeting like this. I mean, if it's mm. in a... Right. Right. So it didn't put anybody actually out. might have been in town office, town hall, possibly, but right. Well, that's not a public building. No, just kidding. Um, so should we uh, pencil it in for the 11th? Uh, and this uh, same time, six o'clock, does that still work for people? Uh, yep. OK. Um, and we've got our homework. Anna, are you, can we prevail upon you to do minutes? Sure, yeah, I can do the minutes for this meeting. All right, great. It's so nice to have Hannah around. <laughs> now, one quick question regarding Hannah. Hannah, uh -huh. are, you a town, are you a town employee? Yes. You are, right? Yes. So can you work on Veterans Day or that would be, if, if that's a holiday? Um, oh, I was just reading this in the employee handbook today. Um, I, I think I can, let me look okay. back at the employee handbook before sure. I misquote. I, I yeah. think maybe the question is, should we be making her work on it? <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. wouldn't be opposed if you rescheduled it to another day, but, um, I'm okay. not sure if it's illegal. Let's see. Okay. Well, well I, I think we should, you would have to either pay her time and a half or give her comp time yeah. at time and a half okay. or something like that. Right. I, I don't know. I don't know which of those is it. But um, if we look at the one Thursday later is the 18th. And I mm -hmm. also wouldn't mind going to the 18th. That would be three weeks. And um, and when was the next Ag Commission meeting, John? I think you said that, but I can't remember. The ninth, I think. Okay, so either way, it's before the meeting. Uh, so we, we, I mean, Tuesdays is is not good because uh, it's that's when they're meeting on that week. Um, mm -hmm. And Wednesday is no good because I have selectmen that week, November tenth. Um, so that's why it's on Thursday. But the following week, there's no selectmen's meeting. I don't oh, have week meeting. is Thanksgiving, isn't it? No, that's uh, next week. No, no, it's not. Yeah, the following week, we look at Tuesday is the 16th, Wednesday is the 17th, Thursday is the 18th. So, um, would you any rather do those, that instead? I or think it might be nice to, to treat our newest employee as, um, you know, as deserving of a day off as anybody else, right? My yeah. employer does not recognize Veterans Day as a as a holiday, not for faculty anyway. So, um, so what, what shall we just go for the 18th and keep it Thursday? The 18th would work for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Well, thank you everybody for doing your thank homework. You. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I will present that motion motion to adjourn anybody gonna second that second okay this is we have to have whenever we have a vote we have to have a roll call because it's on zoom so i'm going to roll call you uh, uh all those in favor john i'm in favor yes uh judy yes george yes joyce yes i just realized as we run around everyone's name starts with the j sound Except Hannah, but eight <laughs> is really close to J in the alphabet, so we can start calling you Jana any old time, right? <laughs> when you're Perfect. on this committee, you'll be Jana. Okay, <laughs> excellent. All right, well, good good night, everybody, and thanks for your good doing night. your homework and keep up the emails. That is really helpful in between. Boy, every meeting I've been in with Hannah has been a nice short one. I hope this keeps up. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Okay. Good night, <laughs> everyone. Good night. Thank thanks. you. Good night. Yeah.